Good morning, my fellow yogic practitioners and Dharma buddies. I'm mighty glad to be alive today. I have another opportunity to live, laugh, love, learn, linger, and live the life we love. I have such deep appreciation. It's such a pleasure for me uh, to be able to speak. And sometimes when I'm asked to come somewhere, wow, what a privilege to study yoga together um, and pull together so many of the things that we all believe in. Uh, I think we all feel that we're experiencing a certain kind of art form as well as a style of life. And because great things mature slowly, this happens over decades or a lifetime of practice. You know, for me, if you literalize everything, you banish beauty to the back burner. The deities in the Indian tradition are transparent to something transcendent. They're supposed to open you up. If you think of God as a concretization or a reification, you make it a process instead of a thing. Um, you know, it all stops there if you can't get beyond the words and the concepts that kind of fixate it and become, I think, a kind of idol worship. Then you can't identify with it. It's blasphemous in the West to think that you are God. But if you understand that the gods are not out there as facts, but they're like transforming stations for energy. And that's why the gods have different arms, right? Two, two arms would be an understatement of their potency. But when you step into this, you feel refreshed, like a communion meal, something new, as it says in the, right away in the Gospels. Unless you're born again, you can't experience what that spiritual kingdom is all about. And here, don't get so lost in the male phrase there. It's not really a kingdom, per se. The realm. You can't experience the spiritual realm unless you're born again and turn your whole motive, like your, your inner browser. What are you really searching for? Spiritual treasure. So consciousness doesn't begin just above the Adam's apple. That's insane. Consciousness is in everything. The whole universe is alive. You got to get that through your head. And you know, when you love something, you want to protect it. And when you realize that all of life, everything, even what we think of as the inanimate, it's filled with consciousness. Um, one of the ideas, of course, in what's expressed as Advaita Vedanta, non-dualist understanding, is the one, whatever that one is, the all, it becomes two. It becomes the pairs of opposites. And that's how we have a relationship. They generate the phenomenal world. And so the different gods seem to be interested in themselves, but they're really inflected parts of energies of the world that we can relate to in our own psyche. The outer name reflects a certain kind of energy, and we can embody it within ourselves if it resonates with us. And of course, our societal action is the place where we, the rubber meets the road, and we can show everybody what our understanding is, how we embody our understanding of the transcendent. Now, of course, in the Indian tradition, they had a caste system which lists for thousands of years the Brahmins were the religious preceptors, the Kshatriyas were the administrators in the white collar class. The Vaishas were the mom and pop blue collar workers. The Sudras were the, the people who did the unskilled labor. And we don't even talk about the untouchables who are like our homeless on the outside of society. But one of the things I, le I learned is that Mr. Andar gave a great interpretation to make understand everybody has an inner Brahman, which means the part of yourself that has to take care of your own study of religion and awe and how you embody that in your life. Everybody has an inner kshatriya, a warrior that draws boundaries and works for the good of everybody, usually delegating and having an overview, a perspective to give the best choice for what works for you and furthers your growth. Then you have the Vaishas, the pers persons who do the boots to the ground work, right? Somebody is running the store, somebody is doing the mercantile trade, somebody is doing all the work to make the family go. You're that person also. And then you're also the sudra. You're the person who's cleaning up the pig waste. You're the person who's like taking out the garbage and uh, bending it down to clean up dog poop. Right? That's you too. And then maybe there's a part of you that's like the untouchable, who you feel ashamed about something and you hide away, you isolate. You don't want anyone to know that this is what's going on within you. So all the castes are within you. The only difference, of course, traditionally from the fixed class that you never grow out of, maybe you'll get another upgrade in the next birth. 
if you do your dharma well is in our society it's all based on economic mobility if you study and you work hard you make something of yourself you rise in the society relative to the prestige of the chump change that the masters of war offer you but you're not fixed in your caste or you could be anybody you want to be like we say you do whatever you do from nine to five but five to nine you're free to be whoever you want so may you discover that the purpose of your life your duty your dharma is to be an intermediary between you the transcend and the transcendent mystery of which your body and your life are the manifestation that's my understanding of hinduism at the caste level and the buddhist understanding of one person meditating to find out what it is to be an enlightened soul